All right, guys, let's give everyone just a moment to return. So I did hit record. I forgot at the beginning, but we are now recording the session, um, just so you know. <clears throat> All right, looks like we're all back. So um, does anybody want to start us off sharing some things that went on in your discussion? I would. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Hi. So uh, my group had an interesting conversation. Uh, well, I brought forward my idea, and I just want to bring it forward to everyone okay. about, so per se, our reality, how we conceive our world, was a simulation or a dream. Would it particularly matter? It only matters once we know. Mm -hmm. To us, our world is our world. And it, you know, we go through everyday life, you know, we make choices, which that is a whole other debate about whether those choices mean anything. But as we go through, if I'm a very firm believer, as long as you believe something to be true, then therefore it'll become true. And the only thing you're missing, if it was a simulation, is you only start missing when you know it's a simulation. To us, we, we have no idea what an outside reality looks like. Therefore, we have no reason to want it. For all we know, an outside reality is bad, and there's a reason we're in a simulation or a dream. Or for all we know, it's totally different from ours, and this is like some test. But it wouldn't it necessarily matter. This is what we know to be our world. Mm -hmm. So what would it change to look for another world that we can never possibly know or understand. Good, yeah, and so we can connect that to uh, something that constrains Descartes' stated methodological procedure or strategy, which is to isolate anything practical or of a lived moral nature. Um, and so if Descartes is doing that, which makes this process or this tactic very much uh, comparatively artificial, that is comparing it to what the ancient skeptics were doing, uh, like Pyro, for instance, who would just stand in front of a bus if it were coming towards him. Well, we might think, um, well, if everything in terms of how the skeptical orientation to the world would matter is set aside, well, then doesn't that mean it doesn't really matter <laughs> in the end? Um, so I think, yeah, you raise a pretty strong point. If it turns out that we are all existing in a simulation, does that mean um, things would change in any fundamental or decisive sense when you wake up in the morning and think about what you have to do or what you might be able to do or want to do? Uh, but perhaps the knowledge of it would diffuse at least um, your embrace or your um, explicit sort of taking seriously of the demands of, of experience in the world. But I don't know, um, but that's a good point. Others, what do you guys think about that? <laughs> so this is like the third prompt, I think, uh, for the discussion forum. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a really interesting argument that um, everything could be simulated. Um, the, the argument being like, there is probably some sort of advanced race who has computing power good enough to effectively simulate an entire universe, um, including conscious beings and stuff like that. Um, and if, if that happens, the chances that we're in the base reality is really unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the idea is if someone is simulating this universe, they are probably doing it for a reason, um, probably doing it to like observe it or something or study it or something. Um, which I take um, as just like kind of an invitation to continue living your life to the fullest, um, continue being nice to people, continue being interesting, um, because, you know, regardless of why this simulation or not simulation of the universe exists, like um, effectively we're all on the same playing field. Mm. Um, and 
I, I don't really know what the distinction between like being in base reality and simulated reality would be because if it's simulated this well, um, like practically it doesn't make any difference for us as conscious beings who are living in this possibly simulated reality. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, it's something that I, I'm like, uh, yeah, the argument for it is, is pretty compelling. Um, but to me, it doesn't matter that much. Yeah, good. Um, so you, you actually articulated Nick Bostrom's kind of probabilistic argument for um, the, the truth that is the probable truth, uh, more than 50% probable that we are existing in a simulation. Um, but there are you know, criticisms of that. So others have more recently pointed out that if we are in fact occupying and living through a simulation, uh, because of the profound um, detail and uh, um, the profoundly nuanced and subtle interlocking dimensions and layers that make up uh, this explorable domain, it would require so much energy <laughs> uh, that you would basically have to um, use every atom in reality for its computational power like quantum computing. So then that drives the probability much lower. Um, but in terms of the probabilistic argument, the idea is uh, because com computational power increases exponentially over the years, it stands to reason. And a part of that power means that we can create more sophisticated virtual spaces or virtual realities. So the idea is if that does increase, those capabilities do um, improve over time at an exponential path, then at some point we would have um, been able to create a world that is as sophisticated and uh, apparently uh, faithful or real as ours is. And so just by the lights of probability, um, the chances that we at this time in 2021 are living in base reality, as you put it, are pretty slim given that there could be a virtual infinity of these alternative <laughs> virtual worlds. Um, so that's good. But then another question you raise is uh, building on Micah's response. What would it really matter? And you say, you should still be nice to people. <laughs> um, and, and why is that? Because we're all, as you also put it, on the same playing field, right? We all find ourselves within the scope of the same simulated reality. Uh, and, and that brings into question or into relief, perhaps, in some sense, what we even mean by reality. What do we mean by reality except uh, the shared and mutually reliable and, as the case may be, mutually disappointing world in which we find ourselves, right? So even if it is a simulation, to what extent is that differentiable from the real as we know it? Um, and if you introduce a theological dimension here, that is that we're all, all occupying a world created and sustained by God, by some sort of divine providence, uh, well, is that very much different from a simulation? Especially if we understand that God in his infinite power, his omnipotence could create uh, a virtual endless series of worlds uh, that are possible and could be actualized. Um, so then, yeah, exactly. When we say simulation, we mean some sort of artificiality vis-a-vis -vis the real, that is vis-a-vis -vis or in relation to um, bedrock, uh, base reality. Um, but what exactly is that relationship? <laughs> uh, so yeah, those are really good questions and good points. Other thoughts on that? Did anyone else have um, maybe a similar point to build on what uh, Daniel and, and um, Micah were talking about? Or do you disagree? Do you think it, it really would matter? I just found an interesting consistency through um, a lot of these readings was just that a lot of people came to the same conclusion that we can feel ourselves and we can confirm ourselves and know that there's something about the thoughts and feelings and um, experiences that we're having that's really real and feels very real to us. But then all of them kind of had a problem with the body where they couldn't, you know, they, you know, some of them said like the brain and the bat that this body, you know, it doesn't even exist and that 
you know, it's completely stimulated and made up, you know, or the floating man where it starts to talk about the body as, you know, not very detectable in truth when you really uh, aren't connected to it visually. So it was really interesting to me that all these different philosophers over all these different great expanses of time came to this conclusion that's like, I believe that I exist, whatever that means, but where do we exist? Does the body exist with us? You know, it, it really, it, it intrigued me that that part is where it, everyone kind of starts to question it. Mm-hmm. They kind of come back to Descartes. The only real truth is that we're here, you know, that we have this brain and this existence. Good. Yeah. And so um, many of these philosophers, if not all of them, seem attuned to the notion that reality as we know it or experience it or relate to it isn't what it appears uh, necessarily, or it isn't reducible in, in the sense of a totality to encapsulate everything that we know or think about it. Um, and so there seems to be a kind of disconnect <laughs> uh, between the origin of our opening to the real. And so Descartes understands that to be thought or thinking and the very real that would be opened up to through that um, illumination or that lens. Um, And so this is a problem after Descartes. So in the modern post-Cartesian landscape that many thinkers are trying to grapple with very seriously to bridge the gap, as it were, uh, between self and world or between thinking and thought, between subject and object. Um, And we can also look at a number of issues that are still plaguing us today that seem to be superficially different, um, like the problem of of environmental degradation, right? The very concept of the environment as something um, over there, (laughs) or like nature even is a better example. So in Southern Oregon, we tend to think of nature as like out there, the mountains, let's go into nature. And then we can like, Uh, escape it, (laughs) we can somehow leave it. Or the very notion to go back to the environment suggests a neutral background over which we as thinking or acting agents carry out our lives and dramas. Um, But if we consider it a neutral background, then we as the agents, as the subjects are somehow distinct from it or apart from it. Um, And that's that's problematic. And that's really, uh, I think the upshot the enduring um, inheritance of Cartesian thinking. And so in the 17th century, Descartes really gives expression to, if not birth to, the bifurcation of of self and world, or um, in his terms, subject and object. Um, And so we're still struggling with that in many ways. Um, Good, yeah, so really nice. Any other thoughts? Did anything else come up that maybe we haven't touched on yet as a group? No, okay, cool. Well, uh, let us proceed then with our presenters. This is a good segue for that. Are you guys going to use any media of any kind or do I have to share my hosting status with you? Uh, We don't have any media. All right, cool. Yeah, go ahead. Take it away. So everyone, let's give them um, our attention. Hi, guys. I'm Cheyenne and I'm going to start off our conversation. Um, the piece that I'm going to be reviewing is the, the floating man, our very short and very intriguing uh, writing by Ivicena. Is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah, that's like the westernized way to pronounce it. But in the Islamic world, he's still usually referred to as Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina. Okay, awesome. And it was written around 1027, like you said, the 11th century. Um, it's really fascinating that this writing was done hundreds of years before Descartes, because it kind of, like I said before, it really kind of goes along the uh, same lines to meditations and the way that they come to this conclusion that the mind is more easily known than the body. Um, And in this translation by Mamura in 1986, uh, basically the first verse that we come upon is um, basically explaining how a human would know he was one thing, a singularity without knowledge of a body. Um, And without that knowledge of a body, he wouldn't know it exists. And so they talk about this thought experiment where you're imagined to be floating through air and you're just 
you know, in this air and nothing is touching you and you're not touching anything. And this conclusion comes to that without that external input, you're not uh, subject to knowing that your body exists. Um, in the second part of the verse, they're talking about how the self is true, um, but no external thing is truly known by humans. Um, again, kind of reiterating what I said before and I saw throughout a lot of these readings was that we feel something inside of us. We know we have this spark, we have this um, soul or, or thing, light inside of us that we can all feel and we all know is true. Um, but that self has no definite shape, length or dimension. When you really think about it, um, when you're dreaming or anything else, you know, some people picture themselves in bodies, but really we're kind of this amorphous soul mass energy when you really um, leave the body aside. And then it also goes on to imagining the body's existence um, is possible, but one wouldn't naturally associate it with self. So they were talking about, you know, you could imagine in that state, imagine a hand, but you wouldn't naturally say, this is my hand, it's attached to my body this length away. You would maybe just picture a hand and picture what it was like and everything. So we don't associate ourselves in that um, kind of primal spirit state with the body and the body is more of a temporal thing. Um, so basically my conclusions from it were that the self is known and can be confirmed or as they say, affirmed and that um, beings must know the soul is separate from the body, which could bring some of us great, you know, comfort knowing that this, you know, biological system is not the only thing that happens. And then um, if one thinks that they're a body, it's suggested in the very last um, phrase that they require educative prodding. So <laughs> they're saying that if you do think your body, maybe you need to read into it more. Maybe you need to really tune into your senses and examine that as a truth. And um, yep, that was basically what I got from it. And just that it was a really interesting thought experiment by this really uh, influential Islamic philosopher that I really enjoyed reading. And then the next person who we have in line is Isaac, and he's going to help us uh, explain brain in a vat. Really cool reading. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, brain in the Vat by uh, John Pollock was actually really interesting story to read, and I liked how it flowed. It's if you have you guys haven't read it yet, it's like this. It, it starts off you kind of like a horror story with some action combined into it, and then there's some jokes in there that actually makes it flow really well. You wouldn't initially think that it's going to drive a lot of thought be, just because it reads like a, just any like entertainment story. But it starts off with this uh, main character, his name's Mike, and he gets this call from Anne, who's the wife of one of his friends, Harry. And Anne is frantic and explaining, Harry's been kidnapped in the middle of the night and I called the cops, but they're not doing anything. They just said to let it go. <laughs> so Mike, who apparently was a commando in his earlier life, goes and investigates this, uh, this place and he finds out where Harry was taken and he breaks into this laboratory and he's hiding and he sees Harry and he sees all these people in white coats standing over Harry, removing his brain and hooking it up to a computer. And he's thinking to himself, oh my God, what are they doing to Harry? Did they kill him? And then the, the lights turn on and they capture Mike. And he's like, oh no, what's gonna happen? And he's looking around, trying to figure out what's going on. And he looks over and he sees his secretary and he's like, what is my secretary doing here? And she uh, come, goes over him and she's like, I bet you think you're so smart and that you were gonna break in here and figure out what was here and you were gonna rescue him. But the thing is, is that you might think Harry's dead, but actually he's alive. We hooked up his brain to this computer that's simulating everything. And he's like, starts to panic about this. He's like, oh no, are they gonna do the same thing to me? And she's like, I bet you think we're gonna do the same thing to you. But the truth is we already did. And it's like this, this final last twist where it's like, wait, <laughs> is he the one that's actually in the simulation to where Harry isn't in a simulation? He, it's just his simulation thinks that Harry's in a simulation. And he starts having this existential crisis where he's like, I don't know what's real. And then he ends it by saying, I almost want to go back to that laboratory just to make sure that they actually did remove my brain and I'm actually in a simulation. So he seeks comfort in just knowing the fact that everything around him isn't real, which is like kind of confusing to think about. 
And this brings up some questions of mine. It's like, how would he even know that he's in the simulation? Like in the matrix, the way that they figure out that everything's a simulation is that Morpheus is actually on the outside. And so like it, took some, it takes an outside force to go into the simulation to let people know that the simulation isn't actually real. Because if you're sitting in the simulation, how could you trust any of your thoughts about the simulation being real? It's, it's really a mind boggle. It also kind of reminded me uh, just, well, the title Brain in a Vat, I originally thought it was going to be like uh, like the heads and jars in Futurama, but it's nothing like that. <laughs> but it's actually kind of like if you guys have seen Rick and Morty, there's this episode where um, Rick is using a, a universe to power his car, but then that universe builds another universe to power that universe. So it's like it brings up this idea of like infinite simulated universes or infinite created universes. It is really interesting. And uh, yeah, that's a, uh, I believe uh, Daniel is going to bring that, wrap it all back uh, to Descartes. To so I'm going to pass it off to him. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, I'm Daniel. Um, the leaf blowers just started going outside right when I, um, I'm starting to speak. So hopefully that's not too much <laughs> of an issue. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about bringing it back to meditation. So um, meditations represents like a, a really thorough thought process by which um, the meditator arrives at their conclusions um, about the like self and the mind. Um, and it begins by deconstructing these like Aristotelian philosophy ideas um, by questioning certain assumptions inherent to that school of thought. Um, like the main thing being the importance that they place on the senses as the like sole source of knowledge. Um, and throughout meditations, Descartes presents like a bunch of thought experiments, um, each designed to strip away like another layer of what we can assume to be true. Like first it's like, um, you know, the senses, the things that we can observe and like make conclusions about. And then it's like, oh wait, but what about all this like knowledge that we think is self-evident like mathematics and things like that. Um, and the dream argument represents like the first of these. Um, and it asserts that we cannot rely on our senses to tell us what exists um, since the sensations that we have uh, can be re replicated in our dreams uh, without the, our mind being able to tell the difference until it like leaves and realizes, oh, wait, that wasn't representative of my reality. I was dreaming. Um, and in the second meditation, Descartes expands on this idea, um, asserting that if he cannot know anything about his senses, whether or not they're real or not, um, he should suppose that he in fact has no senses um, and by extension, no body. And he must, um, but he must exist himself in some capacity to be like having these doubts, having these thoughts. Um, and this is very similar to um, Floating Man in which Avicenna imagines a person who is created in a void with no sensory input to orient themselves. Um, and because they cannot know anything about the shape or um, composition of their body due to their lack of sense, um, they cannot know for sure that their body exists. And yet Avicenna argues that they would still be able to recognize the existence of themselves through um, introspection or some sort of thought process. Um, their consciousness is the only thing that can be affirmed um, which Avicenna takes as proof as to the existence of a soul, um, which is what Descartes kind of hints at as well. Um, and so, like Cheyenne said, it's very interesting to see how Avicenna has arrived at this conclusion like around 600 years before Descartes. And it's probably pretty unlikely that Descartes um, like, uh, was engaged with, in readings of um, this man. Um, but I think it definitely represents a kind of fascination we have as humans with like figuring out what thought is and what exists and what doesn't. Because we see it like all over even like modern sci-fi and stuff. Um, so anyway, um, back to meditations. Um, another one of the famous arguments that is in meditations is the idea of this omnipotent evil demon. Um, which is capable of creating a, a perfect illusion of the outside world. Um, perfect in that the um, 
person can't tell the difference. Um, and thus even knowledge considered a priori, like for example, two plus two equals four, um, or that all triangles have three sides. Um, they could just represent deceptions by this powerful prankster man. Um, however, Descartes concludes in the second meditation that he must exist in some capacity since the demon needs someone to deceive. Um, Descartes says, let him deceive me all he can and will never he will never make it the case that I am nothing while I think that I am something, which I think is a, a little bit of an uncharacteristically optimistic thing for Descartes to say, um, but I think that's really nice. And um, the scenario of a brain in a vat is really just a modern extrapolation of this idea, um, except instead of a demon that's creating illusions, it's some sort of computer that is creating a perfect simulation of reality, um, perfect in that the brain thinks it's just in a normal body. And since the brain is receiving all of the like external inputs that it would in a normal body, there would be no feasible way for the brain, from the brain's perspective, to tell whether it's actually in a, a real skull or if it's in a vat. Um, but like in meditations, even if everything that is experienced or sensed is simulated um, or fake, there must be something that exists in reality to do that experiencing, to be deceived if you are being deceived. Um, but this is where the scenario of a brain in a vat kind of um, deviates from what Descartes is saying in meditations because um, Descartes, he reduced what can be definitely known as real to the act of thinking. Like that's the like lowest he can go while brain in a vat still is um, presupposing that the thing that is experiencing is a brain, like a, a somatic biological physical brain that is required for human thought. Um, which Descartes probably would have been like, well, that could also just be a deception by an omnipotent, uh, omnipotent demon. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I think it's really interesting that both Floating Man and Brain of Vat represent different iterations of a similar idea, um, just with like different perspectives and like nuance from their unique point in time or unique environment. Um, and things that like we supposed to know or assume to know and things like that. But yeah, that's all. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, thanks so much, Daniel and, and um, <clears throat> Isaac and Cheyenne, really good. Um, so yeah, we worked through quite a lot of excellent presentation, but I imagine there are some questions. Does anyone have, have questions for our presenters? Anybody? <laughs> I don't have questions, but I do want to talk about like simulated realities. Sure. Go so ahead. I watched this YouTube video a little bit ago and basically the host of the show was kind of talking about like the end goal of civilization. And so he was using the uh, the Kardashev skill. I don't know how to say that, but it's like the type one civilization, type two, type three. And type three um, is called a galactic civilization and they control energy at the scale of its entire host galaxy. And essentially that's kind of like the end point of what a species can accomplish. And so he was kind of, uh, exploring the idea of what do you do after that right so if you can host if you can use all the energy in your galaxy you have essentially i guess completed everything you can in life if you think of it that way so the only other thing to do is go make a new galaxy and at that point you kind of have the resources to do so and one one thing he was talking about is um like self-replicating nanobots. You drop one on a world and they'll colonize it into a supercomputer. Thought it was interesting, but 
uh, he was just kind of exploring the idea of if there's been a civilization before us and they've kind of completed everything, what's stopping them from making a new reality? Because, I mean, theoretically, they could. They could make, uh, they have the technology and the energy to host a computer. They could upload their consciousness. They could start a new reality. Because they've already exhausted all of the physical limitations of of their uh, universe. I thought that was interesting. If I might ask, then what is the point of a civilization? What is the base? Why is there civilization in that regard? That. Um, what do you mean by why? Like, why would they do that? Or why would they exist? Or... No, like, what is the point of a civilization then? Is it to create these bigger and bigger scaled, you know, uh, scaled relationships and in regards to environment and others? Or is the main goal of... Is this basically this, for to call it in vulgar terms, basically space colonialism? Is that the end goal of civilization? Was civilization created just to take over the stars? Okay, I see what you mean. Um, I'm going to think about that, but. I don't think necessarily it was created to take over the stars. Rather, that's just a product of human curiosity and us liking to mess with things and kind of screw around and just do things like going to the moon. I mean, there's no reason to go to the moon. Like, why go to the moon or why go to Mars? Like, what are you going to get out of that? Except the fact that we get bored um, and we have the if if we have the ability to do something, we'll go out and do it. You know, there's just that that fundamental curiosity um, everyone has uh, with learning and all that stuff more so than other some people more than others. But I think I think it's not the the goal of civilization itself. Rather, it's just a product of how people and like life forms kind of behave. So it's a uniquely human trait then, just. I don't know if it's uniquely human. Um, I think it's. Um, I, if you don't mind me popping in, I would think it would be like uniquely conscious, like conscious beings yeah. kind of have that drive to strive for more, even animals. I mean, in their own way, in their own own um, version of realities they're always trying to strive to reach the top of their um their kingdom their throne and um not to say that like all humans are super selfish and like they need to conquer in order to have meaning but kind of like in a humble way like curiosity why not try and understand like we're a part of it we might as well try and like wrap our heads the best way we can around what it is we're trying to distinguish ourselves as. Thank you, that was very well said. I couldn't have said it better myself. That's yeah, nice, but that sounds a little bit different what Bia just um, introduced than- A little bit, but yeah. uh, it was well said. Yeah, for sure. But so it struck me when, when Alec was originally laying out this thought experiment and way of thinking of ourselves in relation to the world um, it, it, it seems to be in terms of the teleology or the point of it all, as Amanda was asking to um, exhaust all of our possibilities, right? So we want, we have possibilities and it's our possibilities or capabilities that constitute what we are. And so um, the, the telos that drives us forward is the demand to realize all those possibilities. Um, and then once those possibilities have, have been realized, which would be the consummation of, of the will to power, right? Achieving great control over everything. Well, then you have to, as the suggestion was, create a new <laughs> reality with new possibilities. Um, and then this just seems to unfold uh, this kind of um, 
perhaps cynically <laughs> understood cyclically uh, oriented drive um, to just will to will, <laughs> right? To just keep uh, pushing the, the will forward with no real purpose beyond itself, except to exhaust everything it's capable of, and then to move beyond that if possible. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That just, I mean, there's something interesting about that, but that was just the thought that I have. Yeah. But yeah, so Daniel, you have something to add? Sure. Um, I don't know. I just have, um, I, I think we should just be wary of this uh, idea that humans are fundamentally expansionist um, or they are uh, like it's part of our humanity that we want to like take over um, new lands and stuff like that. Um, just because like that was is the dominant uh, ideology and like philosophy of the people who have come out on top um, in like Western society. Um, and so we, we may be convinced that this is the only way for human progress, um, but I don't know, like Descartes and his like radical skepticism, I am inclined to question that as a fundamental truth of humanity. That's all. <laughs> yeah, so um, when I said added. the consummation of metaphysics, I had in mind specifically the consummation of Western metaphysics that had been inaugurated um, in its uh, substantial state as we recognize it now in the 17th century under the, the aegis of, of Cartesian thought in particular. Um, but you're right, that shouldn't be taken as a representation of, of, of what it means to come to terms with human nature as something quite generic um, or fundamental. And perhaps we should even question that very idea <laughs> that there is some determinate human nature that we can know and that we would as human be beholden to. <laughs> Right? And so that's a potentially very destructive trajectory of thinking by which we limit ourselves and what can be known. So if we think, oh, well, it's the human nature to dominate and control and expand, well, then it's a foregone conclusion that that's what we're going to do. <laughs> right? So uh, the description, this is reality, transfers into prescription. This is what we're going to do, or this is what we ought to do or something like that. So I think that's a very important point. We should be careful or wary about that sort of thing. Um, and then also to go back to what Fia was saying earlier, talking about this um, native curiosity that seems to emerge from sentience or consciousness. It's not necessarily human. And we also don't have to import anything into that that's necessarily hegemonic or uh, um, uh, um, dominating or expansionist as Daniel put it. Um, and so also we should perhaps question the very idea of progress. What does it mean to progress? Where, what are we going to? Where are we coming from? Where are we now? Um, yeah, so there are, even if we describe the path that we're traveling along, there is presupposed in that a number of norms or prescriptions which um, don't necessarily uh, um, have to be the way that we organize our, our relationships and manner of, of presence in the world. Right? Um, but this kind of Cartesian starting point, which amounts to the bifurcation of the subject and the object, thought and um, being, or spirit and material, is perhaps um, a deleterious um, you know, aspect of, of, of how we got here in the first place. Right? Um, so good. Uh, any um, other thoughts? I wanted to clarify. Oh, sure. So I wasn't meaning like it's human nature to like conquer. I just more so meant it's human nature to like under like try to understand things and like discover. Um, like it's not human nature to go take over lands and whatever, but it's human nature to be like, well, I wonder what this mushroom does. Like, what if I just eat this? Or uh, I wonder what's that, uh, like why a squirrel is eating a tree nut or just just things like that. Like I wonders or I wonder what happens if I mix these two foods right. or if I light this on fire, does it blow up? Does it, you know, like, but 
but not like conquering mm -hmm. um just more or less like i wonder what's on mars or i wonder if we can all just like power our planet with the sun or i wonder if we can make a spaceship and go out exploring not conquering um i don't think it's human nature to conquer because that more or less implies you're taking something from somebody and that's not necessarily human nature we have like empathy and stuff like that um just kind of uh figure things out good good okay cool so i want to let's take just a brief break um a few minute break and then we'll come back so i have 11 36 we could be back here by like 11 39 or something um, and then we'll we'll work a little more carefully through the second meditation. Um, we'll look at some arguments there. Um, all right, so cool. This has been a great conversation so far. I'll see you guys in just a few minutes. <clears throat> all right, guys. Okay, so I'm back. Let's see. At least Micah is back. Or I'm not sure if you left. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. So we've got some more moving human faces here. That's nice. All right. Um, so I'm just going to leap, as it were, back into our um, slides from Tuesday. So I'll share the screen. Okay. <clears throat> so here's more or less where we left off last time at the conclusion of the first meditation, uh, which begins in this kind of tragic conclusion, um, or I should say, which resolves or dissolves into this uh, rather tragic conclusion. Um, but of course, that's not where the meditator leaves it, um, namely, that the only certainty is that nothing is certain. Um, and so that qualifier in terms of what is knowledge, that is, the adjective certain is very important. It turns out for Descartes that knowledge, and this is precisely what distinguishes true knowing from mere opining, so from opinion or for belief, is uh, the epistemic standard or criterion of certainty, right? So you can only claim to know something if it is certain. And that doesn't mean um, along this ever approximating uh, pathway towards hard objective truth, that's probabilistic where um, you can be more or less certain. Certainty is rather something qualitatively decisive. It's not a quantitative upbuilding. Um, so when I am legitimately certain of something, that means it's not simply probable, meaning it's hard for me to question it. It means that I cannot question it <laughs> because in the question, um, at least in this hidden mysterious way, I'm also at the very same moment providing the answer. And so that's where we're going to move now. Um, and so that's where we find the famous um, cogito argument, as it's usually referred to in shorthand in the literature. Um, so of course, that's shorthand for the Latin um, phrase, which is perhaps the most enduringly famous and influential in the history of philosophy, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, which in that exact language or framing doesn't appear in itself in the course of the meditations, but um, the sentiment, of course, does. Uh, but it does really appear, that sentence um, in particular, in a work that Descartes published a few years later, um, the Discourse on Method, which I think I briefly mentioned last time. So then, at the conclusion of the first meditation, the idea is we could all be in the grip of this supremely powerful and deceptive being, this demon or this genius, or referring now to the language of Pollock, the brain and the vat scenario, uh, some sophisticated uh, computer apparatus that's able to simulate sensory experiences, right? Um, and so that could be the case, which is actively in an ongoing way, pumping into our consciousness false ideas, right? Um, 
Okay, so that could be true, but as Daniel um, articulated so well for us, if that is true, what can we draw from that? Um, so if I am actively being deceived, if I'm living in an illusion, well, then there has to be something to be deceived, right? So even if I can't trust the determinant objective content of any of my experiences as I go about the world, I can at least trust that I exist as the seat, you might say, or uh, the locus or the place in which that content issues forth and stands. Um, so even if I am being deceived, I have to exist in order to be deceived. So then I have to know that I exist at any moment. So this is what I meant last time when I said that this cogito move in this argument from the second meditation becomes the ever renewing act of thought. So I can think a number of things and there are different modes that carry forth thinking as such. So I can calculate if I'm trying to produce some mathematical sum to make sense of a situation um, or trying to weigh an object or put it into meaningful relation with some other object, uh, or I can imagine, so that's a deployment of my thought, I can imagine this coffee cup, the image that I have of it and conjure it up at will, more or less. I can um, hope, so I can hope um, that, uh, I can hope that um, uh, the next four years <laughs> politically will be a, a little bit better than the last. So hoping is a particular involvement or, or a deployment of thought. Uh, I can doubt, and that's really at the heart of this. I can doubt or I can question. Uh, but if I'm doubting something, that is to say, I'm, I'm entertaining the possibility that everything I know to be true is really just the active falsification of some powerful force that remains inaccessible to my present reflection or consciousness. Well, then, even if that happens to be the case, it's still the case that I am thinking because doubting, which has produced uh, this very terrifying thought experiment as a possibility, doubting is just a version or a species of thinking. That is to say, it is a mode that qualifies or determines more concretely the attribute of thinking, which attaches to, as we'll see, my soul, my mind, or my consciousness as its substantial support or substratum, right? So thinking is the attribute of mind. Um, and then we'll see that there is a correspondingly different attribute to matter or to body, which is similarly disposed in various concrete modes uh, that can be understood. And that's really what we confront in the context of the famous um, ball of wax thought experiment, which we will talk about. So um, he says at the very beginning, okay, I can know I exist. That is the beginning of the second meditation. But then what am I? So here we get the pronoun, this I. Uh, what am I? I can know I exist, but I want to know more than that. I want to define, characterize, delimit this I, this self, this ego, this subject. Well, we might be able to draw on um, our previous intellectual or philosophical inheritance. So for example, Aristotle argues um, in a number of contexts um, of his biological work, the human is a rational animal. <laughs> uh, but that's actually a Latinization, really, of what Aristotle said. Um, um, from the Greek, he says um, the, the human anthropo is a zoon logon ekon, which just means the animal, so zoon, that has uh, logos. <laughs> uh, and that's, I think, substantially different than rational animal. Um, but leaving that aside, even if we ask that, we still have to ask another question, right? Well, what does it mean to be rational? What does it mean to be an animal? Uh, and this can give way to an infinite regress. Um, am I a body? <laughs> am I a soul? Uh, similar problems, right? What does it mean to be a body exactly? What does it mean to be a soul? So instead of going down this um, uh, 
unending path, this problematic route, Descartes is adopting a different method, right? So hence the method of his skepticism. And so now let's consider these two sentences. So now we're groping our way towards the argument for um, metaphysical dualism or Cartesian dualism as it's sometimes put or substance dualism. So those are three uh, labels or titles that amount to the same thing. So consider these two sentences. I doubt that my body exists. And compare that to the second sentence. I doubt that I exist. So what is the major difference between these sentences and what they presuppose or what they entail? Well, the first one kind of presupposes that you're not your body because it's not saying like entirely I don't exist. It's just saying my body, a part of my existence does exist. Good, yeah. So there's a separation presented between the I or the voice that's expressing the content of the sentence and then this body that's referred to as an object in the sentence, right? Um, so that's, 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 that's correct. Uh, but compare that to the second sentence. Um, so let's, so before we do that though, I'm staying with the first sentence. And this is, is gonna make more sense because we've already worked through the John Perry dialogue, right? So um, if I do say, I doubt that my body exists, um, if I express that as I just did, that doesn't necessarily mean that I really do doubt that my body exists. So that's not exactly what we care about here in putting these two sentences together. Um, so I can say it just as the meditator does. I doubt that my body exists. I can say that and maybe I don't mean it, <laughs> but I can say it and I can think it. Um, and I can think it as possibly true, right? So I can entertain it as something that might be the case. It could be that my body doesn't exist. But what sort of scenarios would that be found in? So how might it be true <laughs> that that sentence um, is the case, that my body uh, does not exist? So who can give an example uh, based on some things we've talked about already or perhaps some other considerations that would make sense of that? So how might it be true that your body, my body, these things don't exist? The simulation? Yeah. So it could just be a, a simulated bodily experience, right? I could just be a brain in a vet. As right? well. Um, if you live in the simulation, from your perspective, you're not simu like simulated. So your existence from what you perceive is in the simulation. Therefore, it, is, it exists. Um. Yeah, so the, to flesh out the, the sentiment more fully, it would be, I doubt that um, my body exists in the obvious sense that it seems to present itself, <laughs> right? So um, even if we're in a simulation, there's something about the appearance or experience of my body and me being embodied in it or with it uh, that is true insofar as it is generated by this kind of computer apparatus, right? but I could still say uh, the appearance that my body takes within the scope of the simulation is different from its causal sources outside of the simulation, right? Okay, I um, see, I see. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, thank okay. you. Yeah, so then uh, the difference then, so I, again, and this is true for Descartes, right? So this is something I should say that's sometimes confusing for students when he's giving us the thought experiment of this evil demon or evil genius, he doesn't actually think that that's what's going on in the world, right? Uh, we're not reading all of the meditations, all six of the meditations, but if we did, we would see at the end that Descartes uh, comes to really uh, finally reject even the sense of the dream argument. Um, he says, yeah, it's actually pretty obvious when and when we're not dreaming. <laughs> um, so just to give that away. But, uh, 
he really doesn't think that there's an evil demon. And that's not important, whether it's a fact. What's important, and this is same, this is the same in connection to the John Pollock thought experiment, the brain in the vat. What's important is that it's conceivable. And since it's conceivable, so remember Way Rob's distinction between possible and probable, and she being she means by possible logical. Uh, uh, possible in the logical sense, so logical possibility, uh, which really means conceivability. Um, so it's possible that my body doesn't exist in the way it appears, it appears to. It's possible that I'm really a brain in a vat. It's possible that there is this supremely powerful and deceptive being that is pumping false thoughts into my consciousness. Uh, so it's a possibility that's important that's the sense in which we're considering it. So then I can say the sentence, I doubt that my body exists, and I can say it without contradiction. It's meaningful, it makes sense as a legitimate possibility. But notice the difference then when we move to the second sentence, when I say, I doubt that I exist. <laughs> What's going on when I say that? Is it sensible? Is it articulable? Is it conceivable? Uh, is it that is able to stand forth without contradiction in the same way, logically speaking, as is the first sentence? Or what's different about it? The subject and the object are the same. And so if you're saying that this object, the I, doesn't exist, then how can the I say that. <laughs> yeah, perfect, exactly. Right? So this is what scholars refer to as a performative contradiction. So the very second that you make the utterance, I doubt that I exist, you are affirming the very thing you're doubting. <laughs> so when I say I doubt that I exist, well, I must exist if I'm doubting. <laughs> Right? So the expression of doubt is sufficient simultaneously to give concrete expression to the fact of existence, which means that unlike the first sentence, the second sentence is a contradiction, right? because I am affirming at the very same time and in the very same measure the phenomenon that I am denying or doubting. Does that make sense? So here I lay it out more carefully. So I doubt that my body exists. I can easily doubt that. I doubt that I exist. I cannot. I cannot doubt it, um, my own existence, without contradiction. So it seems that Descartes has here, or the meditator has here, located epistemic bedrock, the absolute foundation for all knowledge. And it appears to be thought. <laughs> it appears to be thinking. So really what he's up to in the course of these meditations, as we've discussed so far, is he's trying to lay out an unshakable foundation that could support and sustain the entire edifice of human knowledge, right? So he's looking for necessary uh, conditions for the possibility of knowledge as such. And the very ground, uh, the very foundation for the possibility of knowledge appears to be thought. It appears now to be thinking, right? Um, and so then what does that mean? That means, and this is exactly how to unpack the famous cogito, the I think, therefore I am. So when I'm trying to know uh, the facts of the existence of any object or phenomenon in the world, so now let's distinguish subject, um, the I, uh, from object or things out there as presented to our consciousness. So the fact of the existence of this coffee cup as an object is a different fact than is the fact of my thinking the coffee cup, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? So there is the fact of the coffee cup's existence, that is the existence of this object. But then there's also the fact that I am thinking of this object. So there's the fact of the object, and then there's the fact, uh, that is, there's the fact of the object in terms of its own self subsistence or existence. And then there's the fact of my subjective orientation to the object in thought, right? Now, 
because there is a difference, because there's a separation there, I can always doubt that first fact of objective existence in terms of the coffee cup. Um, and, in, and in another thing to say is there is a difference between the fact of the existence of this object and my thinking, right? Um, but now going to the subjective side, to myself, the I as a subject, um, here, the subject, my I or myself, and my thinking of something like a coffee cup are not separable. So this is how Descartes is able to say, I think, therefore I am. And the therefore, uh, we should be careful about that because it has logically the sense of a kind of um, inference and in argument, right? Uh, so we move from premise to conclusion, but that's not exactly what's going on here. It's more like um, an indubitable intellectual intuition or an immediate grasp such that the very fact of thinking means the fact of my own existence. Whereas, uh, the fact of my thinking of this coffee cup does not necessarily entail the existence of this coffee cup. <laughs> uh, but the fact of thinking of the coffee cup, whether it exists or not, is sufficient to entail the fact of my own existence, which means that thinking and existence as the subject, as the I, are perfectly coincident. They can't be pulled apart. Uh, does that make sense? So I can say the coffee cup is on the table. And right now that's true. <laughs> right now though, that's false. If I say the coffee cup is on the table, but every time I think the cogito, it is made true by the force of the thinking itself. It cannot be falsified. And so that's why this becomes the absolute foundation for all knowledge and the foundation for the upbuilding of any kind of robust and successful scientific inquiry or project, right? So it's no coincidence that this happens at the same time in our history as the emergence of the scientific method under uh, the direction of people like Descartes, um, Galileo, Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, uh, and so forth. Okay. So then the one thing that cannot be doubted without contradiction, um, because you can say, you can pay lip service to this expression, I doubt that I exist. But when you are saying that again, you are affirming the truth of the very thing you're doubting, hence the contradiction. And furthermore though, because you might say, great, I exist, thanks. <laughs> so what? Um, uh, Descartes wants to go further than that, right? He wants to qualify and define the nature of this existence. And so he says, well, what am I? I am a thing that thinks. So as Daniel uh, quoted the text, um, there could be this supremely powerful demon that's falsifying all of the content of my thought. But as long as um, I exist to doubt the content of that thought, as long as I think, this demon cannot make me think that I am nothing, as long as I am thinking that I am something, right? And so then that gives us some opening or some clear sense towards an understanding, not only that we exist, but what we exist as, in what sense do we exist? In other words, the self, right? The I, what is it? Well, I exist, I can know that. And further, I can know I exist as a thinking thing, res cogitans. Um, so now the next step is to characterize and to define what this fundamental attribute is, this thinking. And so here we get to the famous ball of wax thought experiment, <laughs> right? So um, does anyone remember this from the second meditation? So the meditator is sitting there beside his fire and his nice little uh, dressing gown or pajamas, and he's got this perfectly smooth, uniform, spherical ball of wax that had been recently uh, organized and pulled from the honeycomb. 
And so in terms of all of the empirical characteristics or qualities, that is the properties of the thing that are available to our senses, uh, the visual appearance, um, the color of it as a green color, uh, the spherical appearance, which presents itself to the eye, uh, the smoothness of the texture, which I can feel with my fingers, the sound that the ball of wax as a solid object produces if I drop it on the floor or if I knock on it with my knuckles, um, the smell of the wax, it smells like flowers, the taste of the wax, if I were to put it in my mouth, um, these are all the qualities by which I know or recognize or experience the wax. Yet, now the meditator brings it closer to the fire and it begins to change. Every one of those qualities by which he was able to experience and recognize the wax as wax have fundamentally transformed. So it's no longer green in color. It's no longer a perfect sphere as it starts to stretch and expand and move about. Uh, if he were to knock on it, it would no longer be solid and it wouldn't be um, smooth. It would gum um, all over his knuckles, right? It would get on his skin. He wouldn't produce that sound. The smell has changed. If he were to taste it now because of the, the fire, um, <clears throat> the gustatory sense, the savor, the flavor of it would be totally different. In short, every external feature by which the meditator recognizes the ball of wax as wax has been entirely altered. Yet, he knows it is still the same material. He knows it is the same phenomenon. He knows it's the same object, more or less. So the question isn't <clears throat> whether or not the meditator or any of us putting ourselves in a similar situation would do this, would recognize that the wax before the fire is the same as the wax after the fire? That's not the question. He obviously recognizes it without any difficulty, without any effort, and the same would be for us, right? So then the question is, how does that happen? How does he do it? Well, it can't be through his senses because everything that his senses told him about the object has changed, right? Um, and so to be able to recognize it as the same across these differing or transformative states, there has to be something that remains the same and that can be captured as such in consciousness independently or irrespective of these transformations. Um, and he further says, well, it can't be through the imagination. It's not that I somehow imagine that the wax is the same. First, because the faculty of the imagination is in fact dependent on the senses. Um, so I can only imagine, I can only conjure up in my mental picture what my senses have made available. Um, but also um, I can think of things. So he gives the example of a, of a chiliagon or a thousand sided object, <laughs> right? So um, try to, so imagine like a die uh, like a six-sided die, but now imagine that has a thousand sides. Can you produce a mental picture of it? Can you really see every one of those thousand sides? Well, I don't know if you can or not. <laughs> um, that's for you to say, but for Descartes' part as a meditator, he says, no, I can't imagine it, yet I can think it. It's not difficult for me to think such an object. Um, so perhaps that's the key to explaining how he's able to make this pretty obvious or easy um, determination or judgment. Um, it's not through the senses. It's not through the imagination, uh, which is quite limited insofar as it's dependent on the senses. It has to be through thinking then. And so what have we done? We've come to more closely identify, more intimately identify, the capacity of thinking or thought with the I, with the self. And in the same measure, we have distinguished that, we have separated it from that which it is not most essentially. In other words, the body, its senses, and building on that, the capacity or faculty for imagination. Um, so does that make sense? This uh, thought experiment? 
So then what is thinking? <laughs> well, how does he know the wax is the same across these different states? Well, it must be through reason, rationality, or intellect that we determine the identity of the wax. And as a mirroring move in terms of pinpointing or identifying, uh, so to speak, the identity of the object we call wax, we find our own identity right? as that which is capable of capturing it. Um, so the identity of the wax and its materiality reflects back to us a clear understanding of our own identity and subjective selfhood. <clears throat> and so to put it in more scientific language, what can you do with this capacity of thought or reason or intellect? Well, you could, for example, measure the wax's mass. So that's how you could determine it without having to make an assumption, right? You could say, well, this phenomenon that had all of these observable characteristics before I put it in front of the fire has this measure of, of mass, uh, which I can determine through uh, objective procedures. And then I can do the same thing once it is melted and find that it has the same mass. So despite these superficial differences, I see that it's the same thing. And what exactly is it that remains the same of the wax? Well, it's materiality, which can be measured and, and determined through uh, scientific standards or criteria, such as mass, volume, weight, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and so then everything that exists as body, as a material substance, no matter how radically different in appearance these phenomena or objects might be in the course of our experience, they are fundamentally identical. They're fundamentally the same. So this coffee cup is precisely the same thing in its essence as is this table or as is even my hand that holds it. They're the same as body. And what is it that defines body most essentially? It's extension. So that's why he, um, calls bodily phenomena, including our own um, organism, our own bodies as the beings that we are, as the animals that we are, uh, res extensa, because um, it's an extended thing. And to be an extended thing, no matter how qualitatively distinct in terms of experiential properties from other things, to be an extended thing most essentially just means to occupy some determinable measure of space and to exclude other objects or bodies from it, right? So that means this coffee cup um, occupies some volume of space and it excludes other objects from it. So I can't take my cell phone here and smash it into the coffee cup and make them identical, right? That's why uh, they are different. And so they are differentiable in virtue of their extension and the modes of that extension. And so, this is something uh, that Descartes makes possible for us, although he doesn't lay this out in any explicit systematic fashion. That will be left to uh, another philosopher from the same century a little bit later, um, excuse me, uh, <clears throat> uh, Leibniz, German metaphysician and mathematician who along with uh, Newton invented calculus <laughs> independently. So Leibniz and Newton invented calculus uh, but Leibniz built on, um, uh, so Leibniz and John Locke too, by the way, I should mention John Locke was, was someone who did some important work with this systematization here of demarcating primary from secondary qualities, right? So um, in terms of the presence of the wax before it is brought to the fire, how do I know it or experience it? or recognize it? Well, because of its color, for example, because of its sound, because of its smell, because of its texture, taste, and so forth. Um, yet, these are, all the various these are all the very features which changed once the wax was brought before the fire and was given to melting, right? Um, and so these qualities by which a given presence in the world are defined and delimited are not very reliable. <laughs> um, and that's because they're subject to change 
And it's also because they are subject to the conditions of our own subjectivity, right? So uh, perhaps all of you remember the famous dress from several years ago that some people see as, I think it was blue and black, and then other people see it as uh, white and gold. <laughs> um, and maybe even the same person at different times can see it uh, in these two different color schemes. But it's not possible, of course, to see it as both <laughs> color schemes simultaneously. Uh, and so there's some subjective variation when it comes to our experience of color. So depending upon the strength or weakness of our eyes, uh, the visual apparatus there, in terms of lighting conditions, distance and so forth, the color of something might change. Um, and also when it comes to things like smell and taste, right? So if you're sick, for example, uh, your favorite food might taste different. You might not like it if you're sick um, because taste is dependent on subjective features just as much as it is on objective characteristics of the thing you're tasting. And also something like touch, tactility. So like um, if you're holding a hot cup of coffee outside when it's 15 degrees, it's going to feel quite a bit different to you than if you're holding that same hot cup of coffee in your house where it's like 70 degrees or something like that. Um, yet, it's all of these qualities over here or properties or characteristics which are not entangled with dimensions of our subjectivity, that is with our senses. So then I can weigh an object if I have a, a sufficiently calibrated scale, for example, I can weigh this coffee cup and I will come to the exact same measure or conclusion that you will if you weigh the coffee cup. Um, so then we only know what the wax is as essentially res extensa by leaving aside uh, these um, potentially confusing or inaccurate ways of, of disclosure that our secondary properties, dependent as they are on our senses, lay bare. We leave those aside and get to the mathematizable, quantifiable properties. And we do that not through our senses, as we saw with the wax experiment, we do that with our intellect, right? So where have we come now? What am I? I am a thinking thing. Well, what does it mean to be a thinking thing? Most essentially, it means a thing which can calculate, which can measure in a manner that brings us true knowledge independently of differences in my way of experiencing the world through the senses and any other person's manner of experiencing the world through the senses. Okay, so does that make sense? Are there any uh, questions about that? Yeah, so then the secondary qualities like color, taste, smell, sound are subjective, they are sensory, they can be deceptive according to Descartes as we've seen, and that's because they're bound up with the body. They are um, not disentangleable from our bodily um, ways of navigating the world. Whereas these primary qualities are objective, they're not sensory but intellectual, and thus they can be trusted, they're non-deceptive, and instead of being bound up with the body, they're bound up with the mind. So that means when our mind thinks, or grasps in this purely intellectual sense, the truth <clears throat> of a physical thing like the ball of wax, I am at the same time mirroring or reflecting back to me what I most essentially am as a thinking thing. Um, so what does that mean? That we are essentially calculators. <laughs> we are essentially computers of a kind, um, according to Descartes. And so we're almost out of time, but um, I wanted to take some, some time to unpack this argument. And this is an argument that we can distill formally from the second meditation. And this is a way also to build a bridge to Avicenna. <laughs> uh, so premise one, my body has the property that I doubt it. Premise two, my mind does not have the property that I doubt it. Premise three, if two things are identical, and this is, um, by the way, 
uh, an implicit premise. So it's not explicitly stated. And this is what the philosopher Leibniz would call um, the principle of the identity of indiscernibles. So if two things are indiscernible, they can't be distinguished, then that means they have to share the same identity, right? So if two things are identical, that means they have to share all properties in common. So this goes back to what we talked about in the context of Professor Weyrob and John Perry's dialogue uh, that is defining numerical identity. So I can take two pens, for example, or pencils, which look precisely the same in all qualitative respects, but they're not identical, strictly speaking, because they occupy different spatial locations. Um, and that is, in fact, a property that defines and delimits a thing. Therefore, Descartes thinks he can conclude that mind and body are separate substances. Uh, and so this gives us Cartesian dualism. Right? So does that make sense? What do you guys think about this argument? <laughs> So we're, we're out of time, but I just want to get your sense of this argument. Does anyone find a flaw in it? <laughs> um, I, I guess uh, what, what I'm kind of thinking is that just because they are like separate, like identities does not mean that they are necessarily not interconnected. Um, or they don't have, um, yeah, like important connections that like, you know, uh, they affect each other, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Descartes doesn't deny that there is um, some cross um, affect or involvement and in, in important entanglements, although he, he's not quite equipped to adequately explain the nature of these relationships. Um, but, um, so just really quickly, I know we're out of time, but this is a way because it's a formal argument in deductive logic, which means if it's a true, that is valid <laughs> argument, then we should be able to replace the determinant language within it with anything else and it will still be valid. But notice what happens if I change it. Let's say I am completely ignorant of chemistry and I've never heard of H2O. You tell me, well, H2O is just water, but um, I don't know what the fuck H2O is, <laughs> so I doubt it exists, but I bathe in water, I drink it, I rely on it, I very much know what it is, I don't doubt it, but if this principle of the identity of indiscernibles is correct, I have to conclude H2O and water are separate substances, but we know that's not true, <laughs> right? Um, so where did, and this is what I'll leave you with, and we'll talk about it together next week before we get into Hume's um, anti-personal <laughs> identity argument. So we'll, we'll see next week. Hume thinks that the very idea of selfhood is an illusion. But before we explore that, uh, we'll talk more about this. But um, where did Descartes' argument go wrong? This was actually brought to his attention, by the way, and he agreed that um, his argument was invalid but he gives a better one in the sixth meditation. And we'll briefly talk about that uh, before we get into Hume. But yeah, just keep in mind and, and, and try to think about where his reasoning went awry here. Um, so I'll stop sharing. Um, so sorry to keep you a little bit longer. Are there any uh, questions or comments before we go? No, so um, everyone, let's try to give a, a little round of applause for our presenters today. Um, thanks so much, guys. And also for the ones last week, I don't think I did that. Uh, so um, Amanda and Noel, uh, you guys also did an excellent job. So thank you and have a good weekend. And I'll see you guys on Tuesday. <laughs>